Hello and welcome everyone. My name is Andrew Krause. I'm one of the co-founders here at InventRight. I'm going to do a full hour of Q&A on licensing, selling ideas for royalties, which is a really cool business model that my business partner, Stephen, and myself have been coaching and mentoring inventors to do for, I think I need to check the date, but I think we're coming up on 22 years here. And um, we've had students in over 65 countries and we know what we're doing and I am here to answer some of your questions. I see a bunch of folks have already typed in um, some questions. So uh, whenever we do these, uh, not as many people are on and then, I don't know, it's like 10, 15 minutes in, more and more and more people start to attend. So I'm just going to say, if you've got an important question, type it sooner rather than later because I can never get to them all. Um, in the chat, I put um, some re free resources on our website. So if you go to inventright.com and you click on the little blue button in the upper right-hand corner, uh, we have a ton of free resources. We have a webinar series we're doing all year long. Um, we've got the YouTube show, tons of articles and, and other free resources. So the direct link is right there in the chat. I'll take you right to the free resources page. So let your friends and family or fellow inventors know about that. I'm just going to take a sip of water. I just got off a call, so I'm a little, um, just been talking a lot. I need a sip of water. All right, guys, let's get going. Um, for those of you who don't know my style, um, I'm pretty fast and detail-oriented, so hopefully you guys appreciate that. I don't really have any um, complaints about that. My two cents is one person's handle and uh, regular said, yeah, and, and don't forget, it's not legal advice. So I always do a disclaimer. I always end up doing it around the middle. <laughs> but um, anything I share with you today should not be considered legal advice. Please consult your attorney if you're looking for legal advice. Um, but we're going to be offering you some good business advice. So let's, let's jump in here. Um, so just to be clear, for those of you that are new, um, what we guide people to do is licensing. So with licensing, you license your idea to a big company. You do not license to a retailer. Um, although we do have one interesting question here about that that I can answer. You license to a brand that sells at a retailer or the equivalent for a um, industrial product. So, And when you license your product to a brand, you don't ever say, I'm going to sell you my patent or something like that. Um, and you don't really sell your invention. Licensing is essentially renting or leasing it. If they don't perform, they have to give it back to you. So never run around saying, I want to sell you my invention. It's It doesn't set the stage for proper negotiations and it confuses people. You always word, use the word license. I know it's a little more sophisticated. You're not familiar with that term, but they're just going to think you really know your stuff and use that sort of terminology. Um, and when you license to a company, as I always say, it's their money. You don't need to, anybody that's asking you for money, that's not a licensee. That's like an invention promotion company or um, a vendor or somebody. You, you, they, sh they won't be asking you for money, okay? Because these are large companies. They have a lot of money. They have employees and they have distribution, which is what I, the point I was going to get to is it's their money, it's their workforce, and it's their distribution. If they're in 30,000 stores, Hopefully you're in 30,000 stores. So you don't need to start a business. You don't need to raise money. You don't need to go on a silly show like Shark Tank. Well, I just need the money. People think if I just get the money, everything will fall into place. It's like licensing is a hell of a lot sexier than Shark Tank because with licensing, you get the money, the workforce, and the distribution. With Shark Tank, you're still running a business of some sort. You might run out of money and they don't have distribution already. You know, So if you license your dog toy to a company, they have 80, 90 dog toys. And they're already in Petco and PetSmart and Rite Aid and another, maybe their Home Depot probably has a um, pet section. I'm just giving you some examples. Then when you license to that company, you are that company. Anyway, for those of you that have been here before, you don't need to listen to me ramble about benefits of licensing. But since we have new people all the time, I thought I would, man, am I going to need to wear my glasses today? I think I could read it if I sit back here. Um Garfield Curtis Jr. Hey, Andrew, what do you think about licensing to in-store brands? Also, um, a lot of my LinkedIn connect. Okay, so let's do the first part of your question. And what do I think about licensing to in-store brands? So sometimes you don't know it's an in-store brand. You're like, oh, there's mainstays. Is it mainstays of Walmart brand? I think it is. I don't know. It doesn't matter. But 
Um, and you're like, I want a license to those guys because they're at Walmart. And you're like, oh, crap. That's like Walmart themselves. Well, that's that's fine. But most of the time, they will not be into licensing because most in-store brands, it's not always true, and it's, cha it's changing a little bit. But for the most part, um, Target's in-store brand or Walmart's in-store brand or Home Depot or wherever, um, they're just trying to reduce price on generic items. So like it's a chair or a towel or something, and they just want to cut out the middleman and not buy from a brand, throw their old brand on there and make just a little bit more profit. So they're not looking to innovate. They're looking to just make a little bit more profit uh, with their in-store brand and on really things that they know everybody buys all the time. Does that make sense? Now, that can ch that's changing a little bit. So it's perfectly legitimate to license an in-store brand, but it's very rare that you'll be able to pull that off. Those major retailers, in-store brands, um, like I said, they're there to reduce costs, not to really innovate or do something really, really inventive. But I wouldn't. I would say go ahead and reach out to them. They're a little harder to get a hold of, um, but that's perfectly fine. But you're probably fairly unlikely to have that happen. So um, let's see. Let me turn off my notifications here. These were popping up. I want to pay full attention. There we go. You guys are on do not disturb mode, so I can pay full attention to you guys. I'm sitting here reading the questions and my. Apple notifications on my Mac, right there where you guys are typing your questions is popping up and I don't need that. Um, second part of Garfield Curtis, Curtis Jr.'s question is, also a lot of my LinkedIn connections sometimes take a while to respond. How long do I wait before I send follow-ups? Um, I would wait at least two weeks. I mean, so let's, let's talk about that a little bit. So some people, uh, marketing managers you're reaching out to at these brands that you're trying to license to, Sometimes some of those guys or gals are on there every day, sometimes once a week, sometimes every two months. Some of them have a profile on there, but they literally only go on there if they think their job's in danger, just look for a new job. OK, so you're going to get a mixed bag of responsiveness. But man, like when we started InventRight 22 years ago, you didn't have LinkedIn. You didn't have any of this stuff. You were we were mailing sell sheets to people. It's ridiculous. We were going down to telling our students to go down, print up a bunch of color copies, and mail this. And you wouldn't just mail one sell sheet to the inventor, but you to the company, but you would mail like ten so they could hand it out at a meeting, right? And you guys have it so freaking easy now compared to two decades ago when we first started. So I don't want to hear anybody complaining about how it took somebody two weeks to get back to you. It's so freaking easy. Um, it's fine if you complain about that. It's normal. But um, yeah, I would wait at least at least two weeks. But realize that LinkedIn is a little bit different than an email. If you send an email to reach out and then there's crickets and you reach back out again in two weeks, they won't it won't be connected to unless you do it on purpose. You won't be connected to the prior email. Right. But in LinkedIn, if you go in your LinkedIn messages, when you send them another message and then they look at it, they will they will see that you sent a prior one. And all these spammers on LinkedIn, I see that. I'm like, all these ridiculous pitches and I see one after another, I see five pitches and I'm like, screw you, block you, you know? Um, so so you should, you, you need to be careful about reaching out too much. Now, most of you are reaching out too much to the few companies because you don't have enough freaking companies. So you're not keeping yourself busy. So the best recipe for some companies or they're not, it's the company's not responding to you. It's the person, right? For some people not responding to you, the best recipe is to have that list of 30 companies. So you're keeping yourself busy, reaching out in different ways, phone, email, LinkedIn, and you're not like have you don't have like two companies and you're just upset because your favorite company, the guy did not respond for two weeks. But realize when you send another message and another message that they just start piling up on each other. When they finally look at it, they're like, man, this guy's a nag, right? So you got to be careful with that. I would be more conservative with that than be emailing them all the time. But I would wait at le least two weeks. I think two weeks is fine. Um, and then you got to be careful about what you say too or don't say. Um, uh, let's see. Uh, Caleb said, hi, Andrew. Am I safe to have a work for hire drawing slash sell sheet made without having a PPA filed? OK, so it sounds like Caleb's reaching out to a vendor that's going to make some drawings or a sell sheet for them for him. And he doesn't have a PPA yet. 
it's very normal because sometimes you're still in development of the product and you should always have any um, contract uh, designer sign a non-disclosure agreement. Um, and if they don't sign it, I would not work with them. Um, always have them sign that. Uh, but I think that because a lot of times when you're, if you're ready, I so I think it's perfectly fine. You didn't file a PPA, but always have them sign a non-disclosure. And this isn't for companies typically, but for designers, I would have them sign a non-disclosure with an improvements clause. And what is an improvements clause? An improvements clause is a clause that says any anything I send you, I own, and any improvements you come up with, I own. Now. Do I really care? Not so much. Have I ever seen an inventor that I'm aware of get knocked off by a freelancer? These are people that are trying to make a few bucks doing some graphic design. Um, a lot of them are overseas if you're on some of these websites. And they don't, they wouldn't know how to license their way out of a paper bag, even if they thought it was the greatest idea in the world. So I really don't think you should be fearful of that. Um, but I would have them sign an NDA. And if you feel more comfortable, file a PPA. If you're making the sell sheet, you're probably pretty certain what the product would be. So if you want to file a PPA, if you're kind of new to it, but I don't think it's necessary. And again, that's not legal advice. Um, but I've never seen a, con a contract designer ever steal an idea from an inventor. Has it ever happened somewhere in the history of world? Of course it has, probably. Did they ever do anything with it? Probably not. So imagine you got this uh, graphic designer and they're trying to get by by making a few bucks to make a sell sheet. Do they have the money to start a business and rip you off? And no. Do they know how to license? No. So what are you worried about? You know, that's kind of my take on it. But a great question, Caleb. I'm sure a lot of other people uh, worried about that as well. Um, let's see. Ben said, hey, Andrew, how often do companies create workaround products after somebody shows them an idea. So I can just, I can only comment, well, I can comment about our students and I comment about what I've seen. Um, it seems like I cover this almost every, every Q and A session though, but I think it's something that people are worried about. So I think it's always a good question. So I've never had one of our students get knocked off by a potential licensee, a brand that they submitted to in 21, 20, going on 22 years, ever. Now, our students conduct themselves professionally. They have a nice sell sheet. They don't have long rambling emails. They don't send 55 messages and say, are you ripping my, my idea off? I haven't heard back from you on LinkedIn. And so that's, I think, the reason why it hasn't happened to our students. Now, I've talked to some pretty crazy inventors that are not our students that have done some pretty crazy things. Um, and I think I gave this example last time. I remember talking to a guy, I don't even remember his name or even what the product is, but I remember the call really well. And he had interest from this company. I think it was for a year and a half. Why it went a year and a half, I, I you know. But, um, and they hadn't uh, talked about money. And they moved forward and moved forward. And I, I would never let one of our students do this, but he did this. And they spent, I think, eight or $9,000 on prototypes and some engineering stuff. And then when it came time to talk money, this inventor told me, this is what he told me. And I probed for more because I always am disturbed. I would say amused, but I'm really not amused because guys like this is, are hurting you guys. Um, I'm not amused. I'm just, I just want to know what's happening out there. Um, and I asked him more and more about like, okay, so, so you, you, they spent all this money and you're telling me they stole your idea. What happened? He's like, well, time came time to talk about money. I wanted a half million dollars up front and they wouldn't pay it. And, and I told him I'm, I'm not budging. And I'm like, what? I'm like, what made you think that was a good idea? Well, it's worth half a million dollars. Easy. They're going to make millions and millions and millions of dollars off of this. And I'm like, okay, all right, really? And and I was just, I, I just couldn't believe that he did that. So why for, for those of you that are watching and you're thinking like, what's wrong with that, Andrew? Maybe it was worth half a million dollars. I'm going to explain how licensing works. Um when a company licenses a product, they're spending tens of thousands, sometimes hundreds of thousands of dollars just to launch the product. So to, for, to ask for a bunch of upfront money before they've made a cent and they're investing all this money and time and work because they're doing all the work, right? And they're putting out, spending all the money and they're taking all the risk. 
Um, it doesn't really sit well with them to ask for a bunch of upfront money. Ask them to pay, give you the money to pay for the pad, which will protect them and you. Yeah, that's very reasonable. But asking for a half a million dollars up front. Now, I don't care if this thing could have earned them $3 million over time. You would never ask for a half a million dollars up front. You want to get paid as they make money. You make money. And royalties get paid quarterly every three months. So as they make money, you make money. And as they make money, you get paid your royalties. And I'm not saying there aren't situations in which you get some, some upfront money, small amount of upfront money, maybe to pay for the pad. Maybe it's an advance on royalties, but you're not asking for half a million dollars. Um, I mean, if, you, if you're if you running a business and you have you know inventory and all that stuff, yeah, okay, they got to pay for that and distribution and all that, and they're buying your company or whatever. But the approach we teach is your licensing literally with a virtual prototype or prototype or something. So asking them for a ton of upfront money is the best way to kill a deal. So um, so getting back to Ben, um, do companies create workaround products after somebody shows them an idea? Now, this guy told me, I don't know what really happened, but because it wasn't a student of ours who weren't guiding him, it was just a gentleman that called up. And, uh, and he, he said that they worked around his product. Well, they'd spent like $8,000 on it. He insisted on a half a million dollars up front, said he wasn't budging. And he told me some of the other wacky crap he said. And I'm like, and then he said, oh, well, then they figured out another way around it. You know, they figured out another way around me to do it in a slightly different, a different way that didn't violate my patent. And I'm like, I, you know, I, when somebody's that crazy, I try not to engage any more than just listening. Um, and I'm like, oh, okay. But so that's that's an interesting little story there that hopefully kind of helps you guys get in the right mindset. Um, I got some allergies, so if I'm itching my nose, I'm sorry. Uh, it's not really allergies. It was like, you know what it is? I ate a yogurt and I don't eat yogurt anymore. And then it started happening. So I got to stop eating yogurt. I'm not, no, I'm not allergic to dairy. Anyway, <laughs> um, maybe I am. I don't know. Um, Chavez, I can't even pronounce the first part of it because it's just a bunch of random letters and numbers. Because um, some of you guys, you create um, your YouTube username. And by the way, if you just if you want to type in your first name um, instead of your username, you're welcome to do that. But anyway, Chavez, second part of his username. Andrew, if you have something manufactured in the U.S. and then use a fulfillment center, does that take a lot of the grief out of venturing? Um, I think a lot, some people think it does. I think it takes a percentage out. I think it eats into your profit margin. But here's the deal. If you, if we just teach licensing. So venturing is just a fancy way of saying make it and sell it yourself. Um, it doesn't matter if you have a distribution center. You still need to market it. You still need to hire employees. You still need to advertise it. So these people that say, oh, we just get a fulfillment center. It'll be like a piece of cake. I'm like, yeah, but if they're just sitting there with 10,000 units and they're not selling because you don't know how to market it, but does it make it a little bit easier? Yeah, it probably does. I mean, if you think about it, Amazon is a fulfillment center. If you use Amazon fulfillment, you know, of course it's going to make it a little bit easier. Um, I do talk to inventors sometimes that are making their own products and they're just like, oh my God, I'm just like spending like five hours a day just putting these things together. And I'm just, I'm dying here, you know, and they're, they're just, they're putting it together in their garage, you know, or something like that. So yeah, I think it could make it easier if you're venturing and selling the product yourself, but don't be under the delusion that that'll make it all easy. It doesn't make running a business easy. It doesn't, the fulfillment center isn't, uh, isn't advertising for you. You know, they're not selling for you. They're not trying to get distribution for you. You know, they're just fulfilling orders that you got, I'm assuming. And then you fall into that trap with distributors. Well, distributors don't want your product if you're not promoting it. You know, they, they want products that a company is promoting. So don't think a, a distributor is the solution either, which is more or less the same thing. Um, so there's my take on it, Chavez. A good question. You guys are all really good questions here, guys. And even if it's not a good question, it's a good question because it, it illustrates your mind of thinking, your, your, your way of thinking, and then I can kind of give you the right way to think when you're licensing. So even the ones that aren't good questions are good questions. Um, uh, let's see, this is from Bill Max. Uh, hello, Andrew, my invention improves heat sinks used in PCs and laptops, workstations and servers. 
Okay, sounds cool. Is it realistic to get a licensing deal with those mega corporations like Dell, Apple, Intel, AMD, and so on? No, and why would you need to? So I think you know there's there's a ton of manufacturers that will sell heat sinks to those places, and so if you license to one of those heat sink manufacturers, maybe one of these these uh, manufacturers of computers or servers will pick up and buy it. Now I don't know they might manufacture their own heat sinks, etc. Um, I think you're probably a lot more likely to license that to a company that makes heat sinks and sells it to a lot of people than you are to license to a Dell or an Intel or an AMD. And if you license it to um, a manufacturer that makes heat sinks, they might start to take notice of the beautiful design and stuff. But companies like Dell, Apple and Intel and AMD, they're just there. And, and I could count them on like two hands and toes like companies that are almost like too big to license to, like 3M, Procter & Gamble, Apple, Google. Good luck. Good luck. But who cares? There's tons of companies. Like we had one of our students not that long ago licensed to Con Air. Con Air is freaking huge. And they're in all the major big box retailers. So there's tons of brands that are in very large retailers that aren't a 3M or an Apple or a Google. Google's not in retailers, but you get the idea. Um, so this, this disease, which as far as licensing goes, it is a disease to think that, oh, here's my list, Apple, Google, and 3M. I'm like, no, you, you don't know how this works. So now I'm not saying you wouldn't reach out to them at some point, but I think you're bill, you're a lot more likely to license it. There's a ton of companies that make heat sinks for lots of different applications. I would probably go for them. And I probably would 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 hold back on sending to Dell, Apple, Intel, and AMD um, until you've gone to some of the other players. Um, because when you're talking companies that big, you know, um, they might, they and you don't hear me saying this almost ever, except for with companies that big, they might be more likely to figure out a way around you. I know you're like, Andrew, that was the opposite of what you just told me earlier. Companies aren't doing that. It's like, yeah, but the biggest players, the biggest of the big that I can count on two hands and two to two, two feet. I, and why would I be counting on my feet? I don't know, because I'm trying to say under 20 total. That's why I'm saying that. Um, uh, are more likely to figure out a way around. Okay. Um, uh, I've never seen it happen with one of our students, but it could. Margie said, Margie's an old friend. Um, Oh, the same. Yeah. Did you change your name, Margie? Yeah. Okay. Anyway, I'm getting confused. Your last name. Uh, hi, Andrew. Uh, I see InventRight again is offering their smart IP. They are my smart IP. Just kidding. For $99. Um, does that walk you through step by step in writing a PPA, regardless of what type of invention you have? Uh, does an attorney review them? Um, yes, it does. And so if you go to inventright.com and you click on, I think it's protection or patents or something, then you click on another link at the top and it will take you to our smart IP page, which is our software you can buy for $99. And then you can, it'll help you write the provisional patent. And then you just pay the patent office fee of 75 bucks to the patent office, of course. Um, and uh, yeah, we, so we have that again. Absolutely. So thank you for mentioning that. It does not include an attorney reviewing it. And, you know, I'll, I'll tell you, a lot of attorneys, you know, Steve and I have been talking about this lately. And as we're starting, it's not like we didn't know a lot of attorneys before, but as we start to investigate, a higher percentage of patent attorneys are not doing the right thing. Let's put it that way. They are not giving all the facts to inventors that are interested there. Um, yeah, I won't get into all the things that, that they're not doing. But anyway, my point is, um, if you write a provisional patent, and you try to have an attorney review it. If it's a cool attorney, you know, they might review it, but a lot of them, they just, they want to sell you a patent, you know? Now, I have never, in the 22 years we've been doing InventRight, had an inventor write a provisional that got themselves into trouble, you know? Because, the only time the provisional is going to come up later after you license a product is if that one year, when you file a provisional, you have a year to file a non-provisional. Now, if you haven't made public disclosure, you can file that same provisional again. But And you don't get the original date, you get a new date. But And when you file a provisional, let's say you do a licensing deal in around 11 months, 
you do a licensing deal, a company gives you the money because you asked to pay for the patent, you give that to your attorney, and then your attorney will reference the provisional. Great, you've got protection from whatever is in the provisional from that date, and whatever is in the full utility patent from that date. Let's say you added a few things that you missed out in the provisional. I have never had an inventor of ours ever say, oh, I need to reference what was in that year for that protection, like ever. And I bet we never will. Now, could it? Yeah, it could happen. So anyway, my point is, don't get too obsessive about what is or isn't in your PPA. Do a good job with it. And I think you will do a very good job with Smart IP. We've had, at one point, we asked a bunch of our students permission to send the patents that they wrote with Smart IP, the provisional patents applications with Smart IP to an attorney. And, and he was like, whoa, this is like heads and above, or however you say that, I don't know what the saying is, just so far above what I normally see inventors doing with their own provisional patents. Sometimes it's just so terrible and so poorly done. So I really am very proud of that software that we developed with patent attorney Gene Quinn. He did a great job. Stephen and I gave our input, and I think it's a great solution. So if you're interested in that, you can go to um, inventright.com, click on the patents or protection, I think it's patents, and then follow the links and you can you can get that software if you want it. Um, so, but I, I don't find, you know, every once in a while I'll get one of our coaches say, oh, this student, you know, they really, they wrote their provisional with Smart IP and they really want an attorney to review it. And the coach will put the student on with me and I'll talk to them about it. And I explain the main things I always say is, Look, 80% of writing a good provisional is just thinking about the workarounds, variations, improvements. It's not attorney stuff. That's just being an inventor. But the problem is the more longer inventors have been thinking about their idea, the more cemented it became in their brain. When you're writing your PPA, you got to figure out what else could it be? What's the other version that 75% is good? Just as good as mine, but not the version I'm pitching. Throw all that in there. That is 80% of filing a good provisional patent. And then the software guides you on the rest. So, um, and, and then there are the, the, the student will be like, I'll be saying that to the student. And they'll say, oh, okay, yeah, maybe I don't have to reach out to a patent attorney. I, I'm not. And then I, I, I quote statistics. I say, look, it's, it's never an inventor of ours at InventRight, a student of ours not writing a provisional perfectly has never um, been an issue. It could be. Could be. So if you're really paranoid about it, go ahead and attorney review it. But I, this is what I also say is I, I start talking about their sell sheet and I go, well, your sell sheet needs some work, you know, and I look at it and I go, I'm way more concerned that you have a good enough sell sheet so you get interest. Nobody's even going to look at your PPA if your sell sheet sucks and it's not clear. So I'm a I'm hundred times more concerned about the sell sheet and their list of companies and their outreach efforts than any stupid PPA. Now, with that said, we did the software because we want our students and, and non-students to do a great job with it. But think about the variations. So thank you, Margie. Um, Jacob, part two. What was part? Oh, did I, did I answer part one? Jacob, I don't, it says part two, but I don't see part one. And sometimes people say, oh, you didn't answer my question. I'm like, I didn't, it's not there. So Jacob's giving me a part two, and I don't have the part one, Jacob. So maybe you could type in the retype in the part one. It never showed up. It's so weird. Um, let's go. Uh, Dave said, is DRTV submissions portal a good way to submit? Well, there is no DRTV submissions portal. Um, DRTV stands for direct response television also known as infomercials, um, also known as as seen on TV. It's all the same thing. Um, and so Dave is saying, is is a DRTV, DRTV submission portal a good way to submit? I mean, each one will have their own, right? Um, I see no harm in it. Uh, I like going direct to people at that company. Um, we had one DRTV company that told us, I've ne we've never licensed anything through our portal, but we've licensed a bunch of stuff. So I think the, the I, I, don't, I don't have an impression I know, and I've had DRTV companies tell us this, the submissions 
that a lot of these DRTV companies get are just absolute garbage. And there's, there's, there's uh, through the portals and there's a reason. Um, DRTV has kind of a get rich quick vibe to it, make a lot of money really quick. And guess what? You can't. Now it's not with that many products. And I think that's changing, but it, you can make a lot of money very quickly with DRTV, but there are DRTV generally, I'm not speaking about any particular, it's a little sharky. Like if you're worried about getting ripped off and you're still very uncertain, don't do DRTV, okay? You got to accept that risk because there are so many stories of DRTV companies um, seeing something here and then doing something similar, knocking each other off. It's terrible. If you're a paranoid inventor, do not do DRTV. It'll it'll ruin you. Um so I, I would prefer to go direct if you go through their portal and you also go direct, Dave, I think that's fine. Um, but you have to be willing to accept the risk when you do DRTV. It's definitely more risky than just approaching a standard consumer product company or industrial product company or consumer product company that's in a major retailer. Okay. Um, let's see. So just now, for those of you that are joining, I told everybody at the beginning, if you type stuff in soon, I'll get it. I think I'm just getting to the questions just like 10 minutes in right now. So for those of you that if I don't get to your question in the next 27 minutes, it's not my fault. You didn't show up early. You know, we have 60 people here now at the beginning. We only have 15. And that's perfectly fine. You don't have to join. But if I don't get to your question, don't get mad at me. Um, it's free. Uh <laughs> Uh, and if you guys could do me a favor, usually I say this at the end, and if you could click on the subscribe and the notification button below, that would be fantastic. That would be your way of saying thank you, Andrew, for spending a whole hour answering our questions for free. I'd really appreciate that. Uh, let's see. Uh, Tanner said, if I have no startup money and my idea fits the criteria, would it be advantageous to work on with Top Dog Direct first in order to get started? Do you recommend them? Um, so first off, Tanner, um, Top Dog Direct is just one DRTV company. They seem like a decent company, but um, I, I don't recommend or not recommend a particular company, but I did have them on um, to one of our meetings with our students. So obviously that says something about them, but you should never work on a product that you only show to one company. So Tanner, if you're asking about one particular um, you want to, you want to, should I go with them first? I don't know. Yeah. Go with them first, go with somebody else first. I don't care, but you should be for most projects you work on approaching 20 or 30 companies, not two or three. So if you're only going to approach them and nobody else, you might as well just give up right now. Now that's not what you were saying. You were just saying, should I approach them first? Yeah, go for it. That's fine. Um, if they, if you want to, uh, reach out to them, um, I'm not going to endorse any particular company, though. We don't do that. Uh, uh, Wade said, when making our hit list, let's take tennis, for example. If we find a site that appears to only be selling tennis bags, tennis towels, shoes, and hats, maybe our product is a tennis net. Yeah, you got you to gotta take a look at their product line and go, is this going to fit with their product line? And, you know, they're not going to sell something dramatic. Companies are going to do more or less what they do already. They're not going to sell um, bowling balls if they're doing tennis products. Oh, you guys are so good at tennis. You should sell bowling. It's like we don't have that distribution channel set up. But if they're selling a tennis net. <clears throat> now, I don't think people buy tennis nets at the same place. People buy tennis accessories. But that was I know that was just a random example. Is this company still worth contacting? Um, the when you when you know a company's worth contacting is if they're in a major retailer where you want to be. So it's not just looking at their product line, it's going, where do they sell? And you can Google some of their products, or you can you, so that's the way to find out where they sell. You take some if you found the company first, you could Google some of the products and see, oh, it's showing up here, 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 major retailers. Yeah, okay, they're a big company worth reaching out to, sell products in this space. My product would fit in with their product line. Yeah, you should call them. You could do the other way around too. Um, you're in a major retailer, you see a product, then you Google it, you see, oh crap, it's showing up all these other places too. And and then you're like, well, these people are connected. I'm gonna find the company's website, look at their product line. Oh, yes, right, match. Okay, I'm gonna reach out to them. 
So litmus test um, is that they're in major retailers where you want to be. And you really need to, I'm glad you brought it up, Wade, look at their product line. So many inventors, like sometimes Steven or other co-founder will invite somebody on a YouTube show and they'll say, oh yeah, we're open to ideas. And we stop doing that for the most part because then the brand is like, oh my God, I can't do that. I got so much garbage. I watched your YouTube show and we told them that we're doing bicycle accessories. Why are they sending me a hiking product? Like why? Yeah, because the inventor just heard they're open to ideas. So they'll just throw every idea they have at this company. They're so excited that they heard a company's open to ideas. They're not bothering to look at their product line. And when you do that, you're messing it up for the rest of us. Completely unprofessional, completely wasting their time and amateur hour. And companies have been known to close their doors when that happens too much. And, and we've even had a few companies where we had to take down the YouTube video because they got so much garbage from our fans. And it was very embarrassing, um, you know, because they you know, and it, even in the video, it explained like these are the types of products we're doing. And the inventor sent them some completely not related to their product line. So I love that question, Wade. Really look at it. But if it's in that same space and it makes sense, don't overthink it. Go for it. But don't. But use common sense, guys. We've been, if you live in the United States, we're, we're, we're inundated with consumerism and products and things. Any of you, if you use common sense, you can look at a company's product line and figure out, like, this totally doesn't fit in with their product line. Or this totally does. Or, you know, it's a bit of a stretch, but but it, but it's they're not going to be like, oh, my God, what are you doing? So I'm still going to send it. OK, so that's the, the criteria there. Um, I see Dana's on. Welcome, Dana. Uh, Dana is involved in uh, she she and I, mostly her, I got to give her a lot of credit for it, uh, does our Bridging the Gap program for our students. So we bring on CEOs and marketing managers, design team for major companies. And they spent a whole hour on Zoom talking about um, what a bit, little bit about their company and their product line. So again, getting familiar with the product line of the company and what they're looking for. And then we don't even give the students their email, but we give it to their coach. So then if a student's like, oh, I got a product for that company, that company, they just show their coach the sell sheet and the coach will always give it to them, but they want to make sure that their sell sheet is really good it's a right match for the company. And then they give them the email address um, of that person that they saw live or the recording. And th this is just for our students. Um, and then they can submit to that company. So it's called Bridging the Gaps. Really cool program. We couldn't do without Dana. I can't thank her enough for that. She's absolutely fantastic. She's fearless. She licensed um, the shower, hang shower caddy right here. Really cool little product for organizing uh, stuff in your shower. Um, really cool product. And um, she's fearless with reaching out on the phone. And you guys need to learn to be too. Um, but, you know, use three methods, mostly, you know, email, phone, and LinkedIn. Those are the three methods for reaching out. There's other interesting methods too, but those are the three main ones. Um, So RT said, hi, Andrew, thanks for your time. Can a person file a PPA for a specific product? Then another person attempt to file an actual patent for the same idea. Does that person who filed the patent supersede your PPA? So it's whoever filed the filed first, whether it's the PPA or the patent. Now, if you file the PPA but didn't later upgrade it to a utility, um, then it's like it never existed. So it's whoever filed first, basically. Um, K, KD said, I have an idea for an e-bike after I get a pattern is reaching directly to a manufacturer found on Alibaba in China. A good idea. No, it's not at all. I'm worried about the idea being stolen. Yeah, you should, if you're doing that. Um, so you have an idea for an e-bike. Why would you reach out to Alibaba? So I guess maybe if you're looking to make it yourself, but um, yeah, I think you're extremely likely to get knocked off that way if you go on Alibaba. I don't know if you guys know what Alibaba is, but it's a bunch of, it's a website with Chinese manufacturers and you don't license to a Chinese company, guys. I mean, 
we we did have this one Canadian student. He licensed to a Chinese company, and they he showed them one camping product, and then they said, "What else you got? What else you got?" Well, and he ended up licensing a whole line of camping products to them. But that Chinese company had distribution in the United States and Canada. So they weren't just some contract manufacturer in China. They were a brand and they really liked his product. They licensed a whole line of camping products from him. And then I had an Israeli student license an entirely new type of toilet to a Chinese company. But again, that Chinese company was selling toilets in I think it was Home Depot or Lowe's, I forget which. So they had distribution. So you license the companies with distribution, not companies that could just make stuff. And those companies on Alibaba are contract manufacturers. They just make stuff. They don't market stuff. So yeah, that would be a really, really bad idea. Now, if you're going to make it yourself and sell it yourself, Katie, all those bicycles get made over in China. So you're going to have to do that. And you have to be really careful. Now, if you're licensing, you license to Specialized or one of these you know, that's a major bike company or one of these major bike companies, your new e-bike concept. And now when they go overseas, you know, they're going to get a little bit more respect from either their own factory over there or their captive factory or factories they work with. And so then you, it's, that's your form of protection um, if you're licensing. So Matt said, can a single PPA cover multiple items if each item has the same novel features? Um, the PPA, there are no rules. So um, you could you could do that. It's just whether or not it's a good idea. Um, I would personally, I'm not saying you should, I'm saying I would. Um, it was just a bunch of different features and you know, it's different variations of it. Yeah, that's very normal to do that. Um, you, sometimes people think like, oh, I got three versions of this. And so then I have to file three PPAs. I'm like, no, no, they're all related. Just throw it all in the same PPA. There's just different ways of doing it. But do you want to do a PPA? Oh, okay, for this a kitchen cutting board and an e-bike in the same PPA. No, that's getting ridiculous. Don't do that. But um, you said they all have the same novel features, so I would I would go for it. Again, whatever I share with you today is not considered legal advice. Please consult an attorney if you're looking for legal advice. Um, Okay, Tua said, hey, Andrew, would a product that's not fully refined and still has engineering problems to be solved, would that give reason to receive lower royalties? Okay, so not fully refined and still has engineering problems to be solved. It, it depends, you know, I mean, it really depends. Um, I wouldn't, you're not even going to, here's the deal, the reality of it that I've noticed over the last 22 years of doing this is that you're you you just want them to be able to make it whether your royalties will be lower because they figured out a bunch of stuff and you figured out this stuff i wouldn't even worry about it i would just see if you can figure it out with them so if you couldn't figure a bunch of stuff out and you're like you know i think they could figure it out i think they'd be capable of that well then go for it and try to license it and hopefully you can work with them and help them and they're figuring some stuff out and then they bounce it off you and you're like, oh, what about this or that? And you go working together. And then sometimes they're like, we don't have time to figure this out. You figure it out, but we're, we like the product. And you got to be careful about that because sometimes it, it, it'll be like an inventor will be like, oh, I, but I'm going to spend $30,000 figuring out the engineering on this. And it's like, uh, I don't know if that's worth it. And you could go back and they're like, yeah, nah, you know, you don't want to do that. But if there's some simple things you can do to talk to some people, get some samples and figure samples of things that are working and then say, oh, no, I think it can be done because of this, then that's fine. Um, but I wouldn't really worry about it being a lower royalty rate. Um, I think that's a silly thing to worry about. I think you're trying to license a product. And if it's a lower royalty rate because they had to do a ton of work, well, okay, it's all negotiable. So what I can tell you is I really don't this is probably going to be more helpful to you and everybody else. I really don't see um, the negotiations that our negotiation coach Paul does companies beating our students down because the company needs to do a bunch of work to figure this or that out. I really don't see that happening. Um, I'm sure it has happened, but 
I don't see that happening regularly. Like, oh, you know, you, you want to get a 7% royalty and they beat you down to two because you didn't have this, this, and this, and they did a bunch of work. I just don't see that as a common thing. And we, our students are closing deals all the time. So maybe that's helpful to what you're worried about. I, I'm more concerned about them being able to figure it out and being able to make it and make it at a reasonable price and you being able to help them or them being able to figure it out and working on it so that a deal could be done. Not that the royalty rate would be lower, um, but it's like I said, these are all good questions. Um, Paula said, question, under what circumstances is a 3D rendered image preferred to Frankensteining to a Frankenstein image on a cell sheet, Frankenstein image. Okay. So what, what she's kind of saying is doing this beautiful 3d rendering, as opposed to like hacking something together in Photoshop, where you're like taking this product and then you're kind of gluing it to this product in Photoshop or something. It, it really depends on how good it looks. Um, I think the 3d rendering is going to be much better. I think that people's standards these days and also what, you're capable of hiring out at a very reasonable price is amazing these days. So why put something together that looks Frankenstein? Now, Frankensteining a physical product, that's a common thing to do, but Frankensteining whatever you're showing them so it looks like amateur hour and it looks embarrassing, it's probably not a good idea. Um, let's see. But it all depends on how good it looks, right? So. Okay. Uh, our, well, I did RT, so let's get to somebody that I haven't touched yet. Um, let's see. Uh, Mike said, uh, you are not, you are right. We do have, have it easy in this highly connected age. Also easy to mess up big time because the internet never forgets. Meh. Yeah, the internet ever forgets. People forget, though. Um, you could send a stupid email to somebody and they might not remember it. But like I said earlier in the chat, if you send a LinkedIn message, every time you send them another LinkedIn message, they're going to see all the prior LinkedIn messages. And so the internet is reminding the marketing manager that you sent a stupid message before and three more, and now you're sending another one. You know, So it's a good point, Mike. I, I like that point. Um, at the same time, most inventors rip themselves off out of their own fear. If you never reach out to anybody and never say anything, but if you have no idea what's appropriate or you just are making it up, a lot of inventors think this and that's appropriate. And then we look at it, we're like, what made you think that that was the right thing to send? They're like, oh, it just makes sense. Makes sense, right? And they're like, no, it makes no sense. Who told you that? And for some reason with licensing, people make all these assumptions and with inventing. And in other areas, like you wouldn't assume how to, fix a pipe or be a plumber and go, well, I'm just going to do this. You, you, you'd you look it up a little bit, right? Like I fix stuff around the house all the time and I look it up. I do stuff I haven't done before, but for some reason people don't do that. But you guys, you guys are here. You guys are doing it. So good for you because you're doing this Q and A. Um, let's see. Uh, this is Sam says, question, with all the M&A activity, I don't know what M&A activity is these days, still no problem coming up with 30 companies to approach, question mark. I don't know, what, uh, sorry guys, I don't know what M&A activity is. Somebody could type in, I'm, I'm always, I love learning new things. Um, I just don't know what that is, so I can't answer your question. Um, Oh, merger and acquisition. I just, nobody typed it in. I I did it myself. Um, where did it go though? Who was, who wrote that? Because that was a good question. Oh, here we go. It was Sam. Yeah. Okay. So with all the mergers and acquisitions activity these days, still no probably coming with 30 companies to approach. Um, yeah. In most categories, no. Um, but in some categories, you know, there aren't 30 companies. You're right. In some. Um, now, sometimes you think you have the illusion of 30 companies, but like um, our head coach uh, shared with me this chart for the tool industry. And you think you have all these choices, but it's like eight companies own like 80% of it. It's like, holy crap. You thought you're sending the different companies, but it's the same company, different brand, but larger conglomerates. So 
Yeah. And, and I don't like that. I think, um, I think I said this on my last stream too, but I think, I think monopolies are the enemy of capitalism. I really believe in capitalism. I believe in a free market economy. And I'm just going to say it with the Apples and the Googles and the Facebooks and the, some of these companies that, that don't, that dominate so much to the point that it hurts a fr our free market economy. I think it's wrong. Um, I have everything Apple, but I would buy another company's product if it was better than Apple in a heartbeat. And I'm not loyal to them because I, I don't like the things they do. I don't think people should be buying a new cell phone every two years. That's ridiculous. It's not good for, for, and, and I, I don't get me started, but, um, I, I think it's a real problem and I think we need to start, uh, enforcing these anti-monopoly laws. Now I'm 52. So when I was, um, young, I remember they broke up mob. They called it mob bell. I'm almost like not that old that I completely remember it. I think I was really young and they broke it up in all these baby bells. And I, I believe in competition, but I don't believe, um, that, uh, when one company gets so big that they just swallow up and they don't give the other companies a choice, which is almost like they just squeeze them out and suck them up and acquire them. I, I, I'm really against that. I really, really am. And I, I think it's uh, so, but I, I haven't found it to be a problem for our students. I, I do find it to be a little bit of a, a problem in the tool industry. I think they're a little harder to license to because of just that. So I, but generally elsewhere, not, not so much. There are some industries though, but Sam, that was a very, very good question. I really appreciate that. It was a fun one. Um, I mean, like these questions on PPAs and stuff, like it's like the bazillionth time I've answered them. So getting a fun one in there. Thank you. But guys, don't hesitate to answer, ask any question you have because it's all new to you. Um, Uh, DWC said, oh, Dave said, his name's Dave. Uh, hi, Andrew. Heard Stephen Key say, that's our other co-founder. If you send a physical product to a company, they often lose it. Any suggestions? Yes, they do often lose it. They lose it. They break it. This expect That's why you want to be really careful if you only have one prototype of sending it to them. So sometimes one suggestion there, uh, Dave, is uh, a great form of prototype is a video of using the prototype because it gets used right every time. They can't lose it or break it. They can pass it around. So making a video of you using your prototype is sometimes better than sending a prototype and a stage before that, if, and you might not send the prototype at all. Um, but they're just, they're just big. I mean, yeah, obviously self-paid postage coming back. Um, attaching a laminated sheet with a zip tie to the product um, with your contact information, also describing how the product works. It's very common that inventors will think it's a good idea to send a prototype to a company and they, they go, oh, this didn't work. You know, well, it's a prototype. You broke it, you know. But if you have a really thorough instructions, here's how to use it. This is a prototype. Be careful, blah, blah, blah. You're more likely to be successful. But guess what? A video, a, your pro a video of your prototype works right every time. And maybe you got a prototype that doesn't really work completely right. You know they can make it, but you had a hard time making. So you have to shoot the video 10 times before you get it working right. But that's the one you send. Are you lying to them? Absolutely not. You know they can make it. You just had a hard time making it because you're not a professional prototyper. You don't want to go spend five grand or 10 grand on a prototype, right? And so um, perfectly acceptable. So my one solution, David, is one, don't send a prototype, send a video of using the prototype where it works right and is shown and demonstrated perfectly every time, okay? And that might be something that goes even further than your, your sell sheet or your sell sheet video. It might be um, like, like a personal, like you're talking to them and it's like you're in a 10 minute meeting with them and your 10 minutes is too long guys, but, but you know, your, your sell sheet video should always be under 90 seconds, but let's say it is four or five minutes. Because they ask this and they ask that and you show it all working, right? Um, another thing you can do is you can do a Zoom meeting and you can show it there on the Zoom meeting, okay? So, um, but you're right. They lose it. They break it. This expectation that you're always going to get it back or it, they didn't steal it. They just broke it or lost it. It's a big company. Um, so be careful with that. Absolutely. 
Uh, let's see. Let's go with somebody I didn't. Uh, a, a Michelle said, I'd like help in licensing my invention. So A Michelle, go to inventright.com. I'll type it right here. And you can go on our services page and learn more about our programs. And then in the upper right hand corner of eventright.com, if you click on uh, contact us, you can book a, a meeting with Heather or sorry, with Sylvia or Dana. Um, Heather's our customer service manager. And they will talk to you about the program. They will not hard sell you. They'll just, you may be like, hey, I'm just investigating. They'll be totally cool. And um, they, will, they won't like hound you or anything like that. We're really chill. So, and that goes for everybody else too. So go to InventRight and then click on contact us, book a call with one of our advisors to talk about the program, understand more how it works. Because it is pretty crazy how much stuff we help with. I don't think our marketing on our website does what we really do justice. But when you talk to us, I've found that people are like, damn, you do that and that and that too. Um, so um, I definitely book with an advisor if you're interested. Um, let's see. I lost my place there. We got two minutes left. And I've had a long day, but I'm going to answer one or two more questions. Um, I don't know what Donovan talking about. Donovan said, sorry, I'm trying to figure out how to respond. What do you mean what field I am in? Sorry. I don't know who you're talking to, Donovan. That's very confusing. Oh, any hardware or tool companies you could recommend? I'm new at this for licensing. Um, I explained at the top of the hour about a little bit about how to find companies in response to some questions. So if you want to go back and watch the replay, I would do that. Um, uh, R. Herrick, is there ever a case to put out multiple somewhat parallel patents of an invention? Absolutely. And, you know, the affordable way of doing it is a lot of times when you approach companies, you're not done inventing. They're going to present problems. And guess what? You're going to file additional provisionals, not additional patents, additional provisionals. So you file the provisional. They present a problem. You're like, oh, that's interesting. I've got a solution for that. Oh, but before I show it to them, I'm going to file another provisional for $75, not another 10 grand or however much you want to spend on a patent. So it's it's very, I don't know what you mean by parallel or uh, Herrick, um, but it's it's normal to file multiple provisionals and then you know then later file utility and reference those multiple provisionals and it's cost effective too um i don't know what you mean by parallel patents without talking about the product i couldn't really get into the specifics of that i'm skipping over some folks here because i want to get to people that i haven't done any questions from um brandon said marketing and advertising question mark maybe that was in response to something earlier but Brandon, when you're licensing, your marketing is your sell sheet and you're showing your potential licensee, the company you're trying to license to, how they would advertise. And I don't know if that was your question. Maybe that was sometimes when you type in questions in real time and I'm just going, I'm not going to I'm not going to know. Um, but the marketing and advertising is very important and it's not for the company. It's for their customer. You want them to see it and go, oh, if my customer saw this, they would want that. OK. Oh, oh, it was in, it was earlier with the, what was M&A and it was mergers and acquisitions. See, I, I, I just make up questions for you guys and then answer them. Uh, <laughs> so, um, Southbound Cowboys, I have a meeting with a retail, a rather large company for a baby proofing product. I only have a homemade video only showing the functionality of a kind of Frankenstein prototype without a script or, or. CAD file. So you have a meeting. So, you know, I don't know. So the question is, do you have a meeting because they saw your marketing piece? Because that's the way you should do it. So you don't try to get meetings with companies, guys. You won't get them. So you, you get a meeting with a company after they've seen your product and they're intrigued by your video or your sell sheet that is an advertisement showing your product. So uh, Scout Bodum Cowboy. I can't even pronounce it. But anyway, Cowboy um, is your handle. 
Um, if you got a meeting and they haven't seen your product yet, okay, great. Um, I'm kind of a little worried. Like anybody that would meet with an inventor without knowing what the product is first, they got too much time on their hands. Like they're probably not worth talking to. I'm exaggerating to make a point. Um, now, if they saw your product, great. No, but that's fine. If they saw your sell sheet and they're intrigued, they want to talk more, great. You need to know how to handle yourself on that call. Um, what I'm showing them, given that I've made revisions from my PPA, uh, you know, I don't know. Um, you know, you, you have a problem. I'm getting tired here, guys. Uh, but um, it depends. Did they see something and want to meet with you? Or did you just ask for a meeting? If you guys are running around asking for meetings, you're wasting people's time. That is completely and utterly disrespectful of their time. And I get some old school guys that want to do that. And I'm like, dude, that's not how it's done. I'm not saying there isn't some exception. So I don't know if that's what you're doing it, doing with it, Cowboy, where they saw it. And now you're going to show it to them. Just put your best foot forward and talk about the product. I would stick with talking about the product. I wouldn't just throw out, well, I heard Andrew and Steven say a common royalty is 5%. When they say, what, what am I looking for? And I say 5%. Don't do that to yourself. Saying you're looking for a licensing deal and a small royalty. So when they make money, you make money. Of course, the reaction is going to be, what would that royalty be? And you say, well, it all depends on what you do with the product. And talk about that later. But let's talk about the product now, you know, if you're interested in it. Um, all right, guys. Um, I'm three minutes over. Um, I got to I got to almost everybody, but um, I didn't get to everybody. But again, if you want to get your question answered, um, show up sooner rather than later. Um, please help me out personally. I spent a whole hour answering you guys' questions. Subscribe down below. Hit the notification button, that little bell, and the subscribe button. Watch a bunch of our videos. And if you like them, like them. Um, if you don't, you don't. Um, and that's the way you can say thank you to me. And if you guys are interested in getting more help, you're still struggling, feeling like you're going in circles still, which is probably most of you, um, book an appointment with us to talk about our coaching just to learn about it. And we'll show you how, how it works. And then you can decide if it's right for you. Um, also, check out our free resources. I put it at the beginning. If you go to inventright.com um, and then you click on the free resources in the upper right-hand corner of our site, ton of free resources. We're known for that. So take advantage of that. And I remind everybody, take care, keep inventing. Uh, Brandon, thank you. Everybody, thank you for the, for, thanks for doing this. How can I learn about live future videos in advance? So Brandon, um, we, I do this every Monday at four Pacific. So convert to your time zone. But the way you learn about it is click on the subscribe button and then you get notified. But no, it's uh, every Monday at 4 p.m. Pacific. Um, probably won't do this forever, but I don't have any, um, plans for not doing the Monday Q&A. We've been around for 22 years, so um, check it out. All right. See you guys. Bye.